Hello everyone, uh, my name is Julia Voiter and I'm a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle, Germany. For the past six years I've worked on a project that looked at changing discourses and practices in the field of mental health care in Uganda, in particular the emergence and popularization of psychotherapy and psychology since the late 1990s. And my talk today builds on that research. I want to discuss the following question. What happens when practices like psychotherapy and disciplines like psychology that originated in the West but claim to be universal emerge in an African country like Uganda? What drives this emergence? What are the challenges that Ugandan psychotherapists face when trying to establish forms of knowledge and practice that were developed elsewhere and at least in the hegemonic form do not speak to Ugandan lived realities? And on a more theoretical level, how can we conceptualize this process without reiterating colonial and Eurocentric imaginations of a unidirectional knowledge transfer whereby scientific expertise is brought from the Western center to the African periphery? The assumption that psychotherapy and related disciplines like psychology and psychiatry, which together I will refer to as psi, are somehow an African is still widespread. In discourses on global mental health, for instance, Africa is often thought of as a continent that lacks modern, meaning evidence-based, scientific and thus allegedly superior forms of mental health care. This is referred to as a treatment gap. Institutions like the World Health Organization aim to address this gap by designing projects to introduce and upscale psychological and psychiatric services in African countries, thus perpetuating the idea that knowledge and expertise is brought to Africa from the West. While the premise that good mental health care should be available to people across the globe is laudable, the question what constitutes good health care and for whom is not a simple one. And while psychological and psychiatric knowledge can certainly play an important role in Africa, it has to be made relevant to African lived realities. And this knowledge work is mostly done by African academics and practitioners. Many Ugandans I met during my research also thought that psychotherapy is un-African. They considered it a very Western practice and were skeptical that it could be relevant in Ugandan settings. For these Ugandans, most of whom had not experienced psychotherapy themselves, psychological forms of knowledge and practice were not seen as universal and superior, but as highly culturally specific ways of thinking about and dealing with particular kinds of problems. The skeptical view was obviously not shared by all Ugandans, but the pointer is that knowledge or treatment practices are not simply superior in the abstract. They have to be made relevant to particular people and particular contexts. And again, this work, which is more than just translation, is mostly done by African psi experts and mental health workers and often unrecognized in international health discourses. More recently, following broader calls for decolonizing knowledge in Africa, another perspective has gained prominence, which is being promoted by African psychologists, especially in countries like South Africa, where psychology has a longer and somewhat different apartheid-related history. These critical voices posit that psychology, psychology can be a very relevant discipline for Africa, but not in its current form. They criticize that psi knowledge, the way it is taught at universities and practice on the ground, has been imposed by the West and has so far been harmful or at best irrelevant for Africans. Thus, they emphasize the need to decolonize and Africanize psychology. Some, in fact, want to establish a completely separate discipline of African psychology, which would have its own concepts, theories, methods, and even its own history. This perspective draws attention to the big gap between what is learned in African academic institutions and lived realities on the ground. But it also raises far-reaching questions regarding the possibilities and boundaries of universal psychological knowledge and whether science can or should be culturalized. In my talk, I will engage with, with and complexify these three different perspectives, drawing on my fieldwork among psychologists and psychotherapists in Uganda. I will argue that psi cannot be meaningfully conceptualized as un-African, but is a form of knowledge and practice that is increasingly co-produced in diverse African contexts. However, I will also show how colonial legacies and contemporary power knowledge dynamics undermine and devalue the work of African psi experts and limit the possibility of a truly universal psychology. Before I turn to my fieldwork and the more recent developments of psychology in Uganda, I want to say a few words about the broader history of psi in Africa. However, it is necessary to add three caveats. One, there is no single history of psi in Africa. 
Every country is different and some countries like South Africa have rather exceptional histories, but when one can identify some general trends. Two, it is important to distinguish the history of institutional practice. So how did forms of treatment emerge in Africa and psychology until recently did not play a role here at all and the intellectual history of psychiatric and psychological theories about Africa and Africans. And three, history is always told from a particular standpoint. The version I present here relies on well-established work by mostly non-African historians, and it entails particular assumptions about what Psy is and how it emerged in Africa. Some critics have raised the question of whether this history could or should be told differently, starting, for instance, with African founding figures rather than colonial psychiatrists. This debate is important, but I cannot address it here. So the way history is conventionally told, both psychiatry and psychology entered Africa as part of the colonial mission in the mid-19th century, century, and can broadly distinguish four overlapping phases in their subsequent development. Early colonial psy, late colonial and early post-colonial Psy, the decline of Psy starting in the 1970s, and the revival of Psy since the early 2000s. The first mental asylums were established in Sierra Leone, Ghana, and the Cape Colony in the late 19th century, many of them initially for white settlers. However, by the early 20th century, many colonial states had designated if limited spaces for the insane, often in prisons or prison-like facilities, and usually segregated by race. Asylums were predominantly places of confinement for those who disrupted social life, particularly in the urban centres. They were often overcrowded and hardly any treatment was provided. During this early phase, a small number of colonial psychiatrists and psychologists dominated research on mental illness and what they considered abnormal behaviour of Africans. Their theories, locked into a discourse on racial difference and often closely tied to eugenics, promoted three key beliefs that the African is similar to the lobotomized European, that mental illness in Africa reflects failed attempts by primitive Africans to cope with modern civilization, and that depression is rare in Africans due to their underdeveloped sense of individuality and moral conscience. These theories were used to justify colonial control and suppress anti-colonial resistance, particularly in settler colonies. Starting in the 1940s, after the downfall of the eugenics movement, the work of colonial psychiatrists and psychologists with their racial theories about African brains and minds became the subject of profound criticism, most prominently by Franz Fanon, and they were largely dismissed. New fields of transcultural psychiatry and psychology emerged, which tried to establish ways of thinking about and comparing mental processes and behaviours, including mental illness and its treatment, across cultural contexts although Western concepts and theories still figured as benchmarks. At the level of practice, the immediate post-independence era also saw a relatively brief period of distinct attempts to initiate culturally adapted forms of Africanized psychiatry, most prominently by Thomas Lambeau in Nigeria and Henri Coulon in Senegal. New forms of treatment, electroconvulsive therapy and later drugs became widely available. Psychology still did not play a role. Most institutions by then had professional psychiatrists and nurses, most of whom, however, were expatriates. In the 1950s and 60s, the need for African psychiatrists who could better understand and respond to local manifestations of mental illness became apparent, and the first African doctors and nurses were sent to Europe for specialised training in psychiatry. In the 1970s, psychiatry entered a phase of decline in many African states. Due to political conflicts and economic crisis, attempts to set up widely accessible and decentralised psychiatric services largely disappeared. The old mental hospitals that had been set up in earlier periods remained, but they were severely under-resourced and often overcrowded. Health discourses and interventions in Africa prioritise communicable diseases like tuberculosis and HIV, but not mental health. Since the early 2000s, there has been a renewed interest in Psy in Africa. One of the drivers has been the global mental health movement and related efforts by the World Health Organization since the early mid-2000s to increase psychiatric services in low-income countries. While most of these interventions have a strong psychiatric focus, so for instance on improving access to essential psychopharmaceuticals, 
they've also helped to raise awareness of and popularize psychological approaches like psychotherapy and the broader idea of psychological well-being, which emphasizes that mental health services like therapy are not just for the mentally ill. The increasing attention given to mental health care has also been propelled by African psychiatrists and psychologists who see the need for broader and diverse forms of mental health support in their countries. And the growing interest in psychology and psychotherapy, particularly among the African middle classes and youth, is part of a global phenomenon that is, at least in part, spread through social media. Now, in the remainder of my talk, I want to focus on this most recent phase of psi expansion, particularly the broader emergence of psychology and psychotherapy, and give some examples from my research in Uganda. While the beginnings of Ugandan psychiatry date back to the 1930s, psychology and psychotherapy have only started to emerge on a broader scale since the late 1990s, when Ugandan universities started to offer master degree programs in clinical and counseling psychologies, when the first private practices opened in the capital Kampala, and when international psychological interventions were launched in northern Uganda. I carried out fieldwork in two locations, Gulu, the largest town in northern Uganda, and Kampala, to understand and compare the very different emergence of psychotherapy in these settings. In Gulu, the expansion of psi and mental health care was at least initially very much a top-down process, driven by international humanitarian organisations, which launched various trauma interventions after the end of the 20-year civil war in 2006. These services targeted people from lower class backgrounds who live in rural or semi-urban settings and were considered traumatised. Clients were mostly identified through NGOs and initially few came of their own accord, even though therapeutic offers were free of charge. Although over the years mental health services have become more known and accepted, there's still general scepticism among clients, but also among practitioners, whether practices like psychotherapy can really help people with the issues they face. Many live in contexts of ongoing structural and or acute violence and a lack of basic needs, conditions for which talk therapy provides only limited relief. In Kampala, professional forms of psychotherapy started to become institutionalized and gradually expand after MA programs in clinical and counseling psychology were launched in the late 1990s. Soon after, graduates of these programs opened first private practices. Since then, psychotherapeutic discourses, practices and institutions have been slowly but steadily gaining prominence, at least among certain educated, wealthy and cosmopolitan sections of the population. More people are becoming interested in and willing to pay for private therapy, and demand for psychology courses is increasing. In contrast to northern Uganda's international psi regime, the development of psychotherapy in Kampala has been largely driven by a small group of Ugandan therapists, some of whom received their training in the US or UK. For their clients, psychotherapy is attractive because it offers a new and different way of understanding and dealing with problems like stress, interpersonal conflicts, loneliness, anxiety or depression, for which other existing healing approaches, like traditional or faith-based forms of healing, do not offer sufficient or satisfactory solutions. During my fieldwork, I met and interviewed over 30 psychiatrists and psychologists, some international, but most of them Uganda, who were spearheading attempts to establish and expand psi knowledge and services across the country. They were enthusiastic about the prospects psychology and psychiatry had to offer, but they faced various challenges and struggles in making it relevant to Ugandan lived realities. And here I just want to briefly mention three. The first one relates to lack of locally relevant teaching material. Most of the psychology textbooks used in university teaching came from the US or UK and thus did not speak to Ugandan therapy contexts. The examples provided in these books were modelled on typical British or Amer American cases, clients and problems, which are different to those in Uganda. Instructions on how to use family genograms, for instance, did not consider the large and often polygamous family constellations in Uganda. Terms of feelings and emotions that are taken for granted part of everyday language in the US or UK sometimes had no equivalent in Ugandan languages. Although cultural adaptation was a much discussed topic, most graduate ex graduates experienced a profound mismatch between the knowledge they acquired at university and that which was required in practice and they only gradually found the individual strategies for dealing with this gap. 
One of my interlocutors, who had been among the first graduates in counselling psychology, and at the time of our interview already had over 10 years of experience, told me, when you're a young practitioner, just start it. You're trying so much to do only Western psychology because the teaching has only exposed you to this. But when you become more experienced through practice, there's a way you can be in between what is real, so relevant here in Uganda, and what is in the books. The longer you stay in the field, you start to see, okay, this could work. So many new things come into play. As this statement suggests, a lot of locally relevant knowledge is produced by individuals in practice. But due to a lack of resources for producing local teaching materials and the yet small numbers of experienced professionals who are already overburdened with other tasks, this knowledge often get lo gets lost over time. As one interviewee put it, these things involve funding and also trained people. Like, in, like clinical psychology in Uganda now, I think we're not yet 50 people who have actually graduated. People who could sit down and are able to see how we best can design our own instruments that are culturally appropriate. So most of what we use is the Western. My second example relates to the big field of internationally recognized, scientifically validated diagnostic tools like depression scales, intelligence tests, or screening tools for addiction. In Uganda, such proper psychological or psychiatric forms of assessment are very popular, both among therapists and clients, because they seem to provide credible and objective evidence. As one of my interlocutors, a clinical psychologist put it, we need to use the real things so that we make an impact. The vast majority of psychological assessments is developed in Europe or the US. The licenses to use them are often extremely expensive. And even if Ugandan practitioners manage to access them, these tools are usually not sensitive to the Ugandan context. A common example mentioned by my interlocutors was the WISC, an intelligence test for children that was used by some of the private schools in Kampala. One interviewee explained, sometimes we have to adapt these assessments like the WISC. There's a question that asks how many seasons there are and you find in the West they have four seasons, autumn, winter, spring and summer. But here it is different. We either have the wet or the dry season. So we use the questions, but we have to adapt the answers according to what we have here. And when it comes to writing reports, we have to put a disclaimer. These instruments can be applied, however, they're not culturally sensitive. So that whoever's reading the report knows that there's a cultural difference. Other interviewees admitted that they simply adjusted the point scores in the WISC test at the end, so as not to put Ugandan children at a disadvantage, a process that somehow calls into question the whole idea of standardized assessment. The last example concerns international knowledge hierarchies that determine to some extent how different forms of expertise and different experts are valued. While it was common practice for psychologists from Europe or the US to work with Ugandan patients, for instance, as part of trauma relief missions in Northern Uganda, the idea that Ugandan psychologists could provide meaningful therapy to Westerners was much more contested, if considered at all. My Ugandan research assistant, Stella, who was in the final stages of her MA degree in clinical psychology, had been privately employed by an American family to support their autistic daughter with schoolwork and basic social skills training. The girl attended a very expensive international school and Stella had regular meetings with the special needs teacher to report about her work with the girl. The European special needs teacher was openly skeptical about the qualifications of Ugandan psychologists. Whenever a student needed more comprehensive psychological assessment, for instance, the school would seek out Western trained psychologists, even if this meant that they had to fly them in. When I asked her in an interview why the school did not generally employ Ugandan psychologists, the special needs teacher explained. The problem we have is that lots of locally trained people have not necessarily been out of the country. They come to our school and it's so different to what they know. For example, there was one instance when Stella felt that the behavior of the girl was inappropriate, but wouldn't tell the family because she felt maybe that's what Americans, American kids do. So rather than pursue what could have been an uncomfortable cultural conversation, she just didn't say anything. I think sometimes there's the perception that what you see on American TV shows is how all expats raise their families. And so you see the Disney cheeky kinds of teenagers with no parents around, and people here assume that's what all expats must do. So sadly, unless you go and travel, or you have a network of people you can check with, there's no other way to find out really. 
Her statement made me wonder about all the international psychologists in northern Uganda, most of whom also had very little knowledge of their clients' life, life worlds. <coughs> These brief examples from my research reveal a number of things about the contemporary emergence of sign Uganda and Africa more broadly. First, as my comparison of northern Uganda and Kampala demonstrates, the way practices like psychotherapy and disciplines like psychology emerge in African settings is extremely diverse. It is a top-down and a bottom-up process driven by local and international experts. How psychological practices and forms of knowledge are received not only varies between different cultural and socioeconomic milieus, but also depends to a large degree on how sci is made relevant to these particular contexts. Second, Ugandan therapists are not mere receivers or translators of Western psychology. In their daily practice, they produce important psychological knowledge, which, however, rarely enters the academic feedback loop and thus often remains invisible. Third, psychology is not un-African, but psychologists in Uganda and Africa more broadly are often hindered not only by a lack of resources and support in their own countries, but also by historically grown international power knowledge structures, which determine what counts as proper psychology and who can practice it, where and how. I want to end with a few thoughts on how to rethink psychology in Africa. While it is crucially important to challenge your eccentric notions of psychology and the knowledge regimes on which they are built, I wonder whether a decolonizing approach, as suggested by some critical African psychologists, is the best way to go. Decolonizing, in a way, actually reifies that which it seeks to deconstruct. It takes psychology and related disciplines like psychiatry as stable entities and emphasizes their colonial origin. Decolonizing in this sense implies turning backwards to colonial history before being able to move forward or sideways. Furthermore, decolonizing carries the risk of culturalizing when proposing potentially endless new particular psychologies, African psychology, Ugandan psychology, Northern Ugandan psychology, etc. I wonder if instead it would be more fruitful to think of a future-oriented and universalizing approach to psychology, one that starts with the assumption that psychology is not a stable thing, not a given that can simply be decolonized or exported, but a dynamic and emergent discipline that is being applied, appropriated and developed by psychologists across the globe. Recognizing psychology as an emerging universal would change the questions we need to ask. Not how can we bring psychology to Africa, but how can we make psychological knowledge produced in Africa universally visible and valued? Not how can we create a separate discipline of African psychology, but how can we bridge the gap between hegemonic academic knowledge and African lived realities? Thank you.